from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Growing by leaps and bounds. We've been growing it from 112 bulls that first year to about 400 this year. Meet a young top producer and Horizon Award winner who's carving his own path with cattle, raising a red flag. What some lawmakers would like to see happen when it comes to foreign buys of U.S. farmland. Hard choices. You have to think about it, like, do I really need to put three eggs in this recipe right now? As egg prices continue to rise at the grocery store, some call for investigations. A reality check right now on Ag Day. Good morning and welcome to Ag Day. I'm Michelle Rook. Clinton is on assignment. Iowa is having to call more birds after another avian influenza case broke out in a turkey flock in northwest Iowa. This latest outbreak in Buena Vista County brings the number of turkeys, chickens, and other birds the state has had to call to nearly 16 million. You can see on this map, Iowa has been the hardest hit. Nationwide, more than 58 million birds have been affected. It's one of the main reasons we continue to see eggs at the store at the highest levels in 50 years. And that has lawmakers in an activist group called Farm Action asking the Federal Trade Commission to investigate possible price gouging and deceptive practices. Concerned major egg producers might be taking advantage of the situation. Lawmakers, including Senator Jake Reed of Rhode Island, have asked for the probe, noting egg prices were up 138 percent in December versus a year ago, with the largest egg producer in the U.S., Kelmeen Foods, reporting record profits of $323 million in their most recent quarter, up 22 percent. Nationwide eggs in December averaged $4.25 per dozen compared to $1.78 a year ago, putting the squeeze on consumers. I've seen uh, 18 eggs for 8 bucks. You have to think about it, like, do I really need to put three eggs in this recipe right now? Lawmakers are also pointing to USDA data that shows the layer flock is only 6% below normal levels. But a Purdue economist says that number is much higher spread out over the whole year. Plus, add in general food inflation and the underlying economics don't warrant a probe. In, in particular, we have had high, higher feed prices, higher other, other input costs have been higher too. But really, the, the key driver here is bird flu. When you remove 10 to 15% of your egg laying flock over the course of a year, that's going to have big impacts on egg prices. Andy says the price of eggs is fairly inelastic. There's not, not good options for you to substitute towards. And as a result, consumers' purchases of eggs tend to be fairly price insensitive. Consumer yeah. demands inelastic, and as a result, small changes in quantity end up causing big changes in prices. Lusk also points out this bird flu outbreak has been different than 2015 because the numbers are higher and there has been a second wave of cases this fall and winter. He says the good news is egg prices in the store should start to fall soon as producers can quickly repopulate and ramp up production. Some lawmakers are renewing their efforts to increase oversight of foreign purchases of U.S. farmland. Bipartisan legislation is being introduced that would put the ag sector in the domain of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. It's a federal panel that reviews investments for national security interests. Currently, federal law imposes no restrictions on the amount of private U.S. ag land that can be foreign owned. However, foreign entities must provide some information to USDA. Some states have instituted restrictions or are looking to pass legislation like South Dakota. Currently in statute, you, if it's over 160 acres, you're supposed to report to USDA and report to the state. Um, it doesn't track very well. It's, it's a little clunky. We've never um, cracked down on one of those purchases. We're not aware of them They're really happening a lot. So uh, looking at kind of a different group that would have a council that would advise the governor on uh, how we should control these foreign ag land purchases. USDA reporting at the end of 2021, Canada held the largest share of foreign-held U.S. ag land at 31 percent. Investors from the Netherlands, Italy, the U.K. and Germany combined to hold another 31 percent. China owns slightly less than 1 percent. Now, foreign investors held just over 3 percent of all privately held ag lands. A man accused of killing seven fellow farm workers in back-to-back -back shootings at two Northern California farms is now facing seven counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. Authorities believe 66-year-old Chung Li Zhao acted alone when he killed workers at two farms in Half Moon Bay. 
The charges against him include additional allegations that could result in the death penalty or life in prison without parole. However, the state's governor has issued a moratorium on executions. Get ready for more snow in the Midwest, along with colder air. Meteorologist Chuck Kiever joins us with the latest. Well, taking a look at the recent root zone report, while the West Coast has finally absorbed some of that moisture that they received, that's getting still back to normal a bit. But in the center part of the country, near Dodge City, dry as a bone. But snow is going to be the norm over the northern half of the country. You can see here, it's going to pile up all the way across the country and a little bit further south down in Oklahoma. Yes, and check this out, Jim Herzog. Jim says it's always important when knowledge is passed from generation to generation on the farm. He's from Pasick, Missouri, sharing this picture, says his grandson just had to get in the cab with him. He says the little guy was upset when he wouldn't let him ride. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. What could corn, soybean, and wheat acres look like this year? S&P Global Commodity Insights releasing its forecast. It's projecting farmers will plant 90.5 million acres of corn this year. That's up more than 2% from last year. It puts soybeans at 88 million acres, up less than 1%. All wheat plantings are projected at 49.8 million acres. That's up 9%. Flip Your Soil on Ag Day is brought to you by ESN Smart Nitrogen. When it comes to farmers flipping their soil and improving soil health, there are many common threads of success that have emerged from farmers and their trials and errors on their own farms. Iowa farmer Michael Vitito says they've been no-tilling since the 80s and plant cover crops on 100% of their acres. Planting cereal rye ahead of soybeans is when they improve their ability to control resistant weeds and over time cut their herbicide use. We've kind of figured out a way to not only cut back on the weed pressure, but we're also cutting back on the amount of chemicals that we're using. So we've cut our chemical use by, we're probably close to 75% right now. Um, so yeah, we're, you know, if you're only using 25% of the chemicals that you were before, all of a sudden that starts to pay for your cover crop seed and whatnot. Ohio producer Les Seiler has been no-tilling since 1986 and using cover crops since 2008. And says the increased microbiological activity in their soils has also cut their input bills. It gives us the ability to cut back on our commercial, commercial fertilizers, um, cut back or eliminate in some cases. I mean, in this, in this particular field here, we haven't applied phosphorus here. Um, we just harvested our eighth corn crop with zero phosphorus at planting time. Plus, he says the healthier soils increase the resiliency of their crops during stress periods, which translates into yield. Markets were mostly higher on Thursday, with the exception of cattle, but some nice gains in the grains. I'll have some analysis coming up. And later, one man's dream to become a cowboy comes true, and now he's carving a name for himself in the cattle business. Coming up. Thursday's market close is mostly higher except for cattle. Vince Boddicker, Farmers Trading Company, is joining us. And uh, Vince, we saw all the grains to the plus side, but soybeans, um, do you think we were trying to price in this smaller crop in Argentina, or was it technical? I think it could be a little of both, but I think most of it's a smaller crop in Argentina. We had Oil World on Wednesday come out and talk about the fact of a 34 million metric ton crop where everybody else is over 40. And again, you did hold it some areas that 1335 area and new crop beans was something. If we go through that, I think you still go back and you may still come back if rains continue and try to fill that gap at 1269, but time will tell us. Well, we did see the contracts the November get back up above some key areas. We saw a March get back above $15. That was pretty important, wasn't it? I think it was. And the other part that was important, to, the November didn't keep up, but the bull spreads are working. Yeah. And that's what you like to see if you think it's going higher. Meal was back in that leadership role. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, there's lots of guys that were really bearish set, and they're sure nothing saying that when this thing tips when it wants to, you could sure see bigger spreading between oil and meal. But so far, you haven't seen a lot of that. So was corn just a follower of wheat and soybeans on Thursday? I think so. Um, you've had the last couple of days, corn's tried to do a few things. 
but we did come down to key areas on what was it on Sunday night, Monday, or Monday night we got down to that uh, six sixty one area, which should be good support in old crop, and you're still in a range that corn doesn't like to spend a lot of time between six sixty and six eighty. So I don't think we'll be here a lot of days. We're going to break out one way or the other. And we, we were putting in risk premium, but also India news kind of drove the market, didn't it? That's what I think. And I, I think we had some risk premium today uh, because of the more airstrikes in Ukraine. But I think a lot of it started yesterday when Tuesday we had record prices in India. Again, on Wednesday, we saw some of those things where they were record prices. And now we come back and say, well, they put restrictions on we, they did talk about taking 3 million metric tons out of reserves to do it, but let's see what happens. Well, a good day overall. Thanks so much for joining us, Vince Boddicker, and we have more Ag Day coming up. Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Closing Wheels provide quicker emergence and are more consistent in dry conditions than any other closing wheels. Order 12 to 16 rows today and qualify for free shipping or 20% off an end zone moisture management package. Joining us this morning with our national lab forecast is meteorologist Chuck Kiever. And we talked about snow yesterday, and that seems to be the big story with snow all the way down into the southern plains. Yeah, we have snow coming because we're going to get a little bit of cold air, and then some several clipper systems are going to move across the country. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Let's take a look. Okay, let's take a look at the jet stream first. You can see a lot of that cold Canadian air still bottled up in the northern part of the country, but that's going to provide just enough cold air for the snow and for clipper systems to work their way across the United States, but not a lot of very cold air intrusion until the latter part of next week in the Northeast. But you can see these clipper systems one right here. This is future radar out to the west over Minneapolis and then another Alberta clipper that's going to work their way like a train across the country. This one getting some Gulf moisture to interact with it. So we'll see how that unwinds and then another storm. So we're going to get a lot of snowfall over the next five to seven days, especially through the Midwest. This is an association with uh, storms that push through the one, especially on the weekend. And then, yes, the snowfalls we talked about earlier. The snowfall is just going to lay itself down all the way across the country with totals upwards of maybe a foot in some locations as that even down in the northern part of Texas as that colder air works its way down in. All right, temperatures this afternoon, we got 49 in St. Louis, 66 in Los Angeles, relatively mild for this time of the year. For evening lows, we're down to 25 in St. Louis, and you got to go all the way down to Miami where you're going to get a 72 degree low to stay a little bit warm. Temperatures tomorrow in the afternoon, again, still mild. The only really cold air is up in Minneapolis and Bismarck with a high of only one degree. Wow, that's cold. All right, let's take a look closer to home. Elko, Nevada, snow showers, blowing snow, a high 29, a low of 16. Austin, Texas, 59 and 45 with sun and Mino, North Dakota, 15 and minus 12. Ag Day is brought to you by Golden Harvest. Broad adaptability, high yield potential, solid agronomics, great late season health. The foundations of a successful season start with Golden Harvest Game Changing Corn. Find your hybrid at GameChangingCorn.com. It's been another busy week for ranchers working hard to protect livestock in snowy and cold conditions. That includes northern Arkansas, where some places saw a foot of snow. Chad Hooten of the Arkansas Farm Bureau has an update on how producers weathered the storm. We had about 10 inches, give or take where you're at. Lost power about 10 o'clock, but we're going to make it through. Larry Blaisdell farms in Marion County, close to Flippin, Arkansas. Hello. He was one of many farmers out in force Wednesday, keeping their land and herds safe and healthy after a winter storm dumped as much as a foot of snow across some of the state's northern counties. Blaisdell braced for the storm on Tuesday and was up early Wednesday checking on his cattle. I fed extra hay yesterday, headed down to another place to feed. We got about three groups of 25 and a bull and a and uh, one group of 45 and two bulls, that's where I'm headed next. 
About 75 miles west of Blaisdell's farm, Jeremy Miller had seven to eight inches fall on his 700 plus acres outside of Huntsville near Clifty in Madison County. Miller cares for 130 mama cows and on Wednesday got extra help from his son Brock out of school for the day. The Millers are feeding grain daily to 40 weaning calves. And across the state in Izzard County, close to six inches hit Dennis Taylor's operation just northeast of Melbourne in Franklin, Arkansas. But the good news about this storm is it was not an extremely frigid event. Pastures are covered, but warmer temperatures and less wind made it more bearable for cattle. And of course, Arkansas farmers are working and adapting although it's probably been harder for Blaisdell than others. Hard to believe, two weeks ago I was in Puerto Rico at the uh, National Farm Bureau Convention on a beach. Now I'm in about 10 inches of snow, but uh, anyway, we, we're faring pretty good. Coming up, how one man's passion for the cattle business is earning him top honors. Ag Day is brought to you by Duracade Viptera. In the Country on Ag Day is brought to you by Pivot Bio. What if you had the nitrogen you need already on seed? Pivot Bio is the first company to apply nitrogen on seed. The nitrogen you need, now on seed, from Pivot Bio. Learn more at pivotbio.com. This morning we introduce you to our final award winner from this year's Top Producer Summit. He's a rancher from Nebraska who is starting to make a name for himself in the cattle business. And that's why he's the winner of tomorrow's Top Producer Horizon Award. Trey Wasserberger always wanted to be a cowboy, but there was no opportunity in his family. Instead, his journey into the purebred business started in October of 2016. Greg Wilkie put us together and said, I want you to meet Bill Rischel. He's He's a legend within the Angus breed. The two met at the ranch near North Platte, Nebraska. Rachel quickly saw the passion Trey had for the cattle business and within a matter of weeks made him his protege. Trey never owned registered stock prior to that, but he and wife Dana jumped in with both feet. And then January 1, I owned a seed stock uh, business and never even worked on one. In March, I had my first bull sale. Now this will be our fifth bull sale of our own, and uh, we've been growing it from 112 bulls that first year to about 400 this year. Those bulls are sold in 30 plus states, and to show accountability, commercial customers can sell or consign their feeder cattle into the first of its kind TD feed test. We do it about a $25,000 uh, award, five categories for uh, you know those customers in the TD feed test, and prime percentage and CAB percentage, uh, highest yield, which is a lot of value there. Residual daily gain, average daily gain, ADG, so that's about 5,000 to each category. TD Angus also owns 1,200 registered cows, and to accelerate genetic improvements, they put three to 400 embryos a year in their own and customers' herds. They also conduct DNA and genomic testing on all the offspring. I want to DNA that calf at birth and, and have him registered with his DNA because if I like what happened genetically, I might do it again. TD Angus specializes in cattle procurement and heifer development and runs 4,500 yearlings on grass and develops four to 600 commercial bred heifers a year. We'll go back out there and, and try to buy those calves back, those steer calves specifically, and also do a heifer development program for the heifer calves so we have an avenue for both sets of calves and then uh, usually try to get them back here to our family feedlot. And that commercial feed yard features their own genetics and their own feed. Kirk Olson, Dana's uh, dad feeds about 50,000. And uh, you know, our feed test gets about four or 5,000 every year. So uh, that's a big part of our business as well. But Wasserburgers didn't stop there. The pandemic showed them how fragile the food supply and the cattle market was. And from that, sustainable beef was born. We got first time ever we actually have under one roof and under one team of sustainable beef. We have, we have a seed stock producer that's gonna provide a high marbling, high tenderness uh, uh, product to, to sire these calves. It's gonna go out, you know, hopefully all over the country, come back to our family feedlot, and then go to, you know, sustainable beef and then go into Walmart's feed supply. This is a one of a kind supply chain partnership with Walmart and it stemmed from shared sustainability goals. What's really cool is, is our carbon footprint is limited, um, all without 15 miles of each other. These bulls, our feedlot, and our packing plant in the Walmart distribution center are all within 15 miles of each other. And that's huge, and we're proud of that. 
The nearly $400 million plant is currently under construction and will be ready for business in 2024. Wasserberger says it's the last step in their conception to consumer model. And it's just one of the reasons this visionary leader is tomorrow's top producer Horizon Award winner. And congratulations to all the winners and finalists, and you can see all their stories on agweb.com. That's all the time we have for this morning. From all of us here at the Ag Day team, have a great day.